Hello and welcome to Trad Jazz Today. Dan Zeilinger has been a world-traveling trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of his most memorable performances were on the lawn of the Edinburgh Castle, at the Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials around the world. Dan has met many people during his career and has spent many hours on and off stage with these musicians, talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on weekends with their friends. They all have stories worthy of a movie script, and through these interviews, Dan will be sharing them with you. Now, Dan Zeilinger. <laughs> Hi, this is Dan Zeilinger with Trad Jazz Today. My next guest is somebody who uh, I fought with for a very long time for work. Uh, <laughs> uh, although he, I, I like to think of him as a good friend, I hope he thinks the same of me. And, uh, and we ended up on a couple of things together at some point in time. But, uh, and now he's a, a, a band director. I guess you've been at uh, Long Beach Wilson now for what, 16 years or 19 years? Uh, this is my 19th year, 2002. And I started teaching in 1999, so. So not only are we both tuba and bass players, uh, we both uh, dug it out in the trenches with the school system, uh, one way or another. But here he is, sir, Mr. Eric Metrisman. Actually, we have a lot of parallels. We do. We, you know, I mean, we are both playing a lot of Dixieland, especially like in the eighties, nineties. And and I'll bet you your that. kids talk call you Mr. M. I am Mr. M. See, Actually, my very first principal said, "You're Mr. M." Because nobody wants to say Zeilinger or Metterschmidt. No, no, it's Mr. M. Is it's us Mr. German guys that are screwing it up for everybody. <laughs> you know, I I had talked to uh, I, I you probably uh, remember um, if I can remember. And Dan Dan Marcus, yeah, Dan Marcus, a tuba player from uh, the Pacific Northwest. He uh -huh. had a theory that all of us, all of us tuba players, came from one boat from Germany. Uh, <laughs> well, back in the day, all your instruments were German too. I mean, Miraphone. I mean, I grew up in the Valley, and the Miraphone factory had an outlet in in San Fernando. I remember picking out my first tuba, going to like this sea of tubas. It was awesome of Miraphone oh, tubas. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I. I never had that chance, but that's yeah, not that sound. Yeah. But I did play a microphone for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, until well, that's the only one I got left. I have my little 85 back there. But, I can see uh, it. But I, I stopped playing for a long time, but I've started again. So who knows? I might pick up another tuba or something. <laughs> well, let's go to the beginning. If, if you've seen yes. my show, you realize that I like to talk people through their, their musical lives and, and just find out uh, what was the path that led them to where they are today. Sure. And, uh, and hope to help them find a path out of it. No, I'm My kidding. path of misadventure. No. <laughs> well, when you're, talking, when you're talking about the minors, that certainly is part of it, you know? That's probably the best shows, right? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. actually. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Who was probably my most interesting interview so far when it comes to misadventures? Oh, no. I, I, most of it happened off the air. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I won't risk, you know, <laughs> ruining friendships. <laughs> uh, you were born in Northridge? Uh, well, I was born in Burbank. My father, uh, yeah, my family, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, grew up in Northridge area. And um, yeah, I went to Cal State Northridge, basically, because the band director there. Now, see, you're getting me. too, you're I, getting too far ahead of me now. I want to stay, I want to stay back in your infancy. Okay. Uh, uh, just because, uh, yes, because I'm weird that way. Okay, yeah, I'll slow down. That was, was, was tuba your first instrument? No, piano was my first instrument. And I, how old uh, were you? I was eight years old, started taking lessons with Mrs. Finch, who was teaching my older sister. And I begged and pleaded my parents. I said, please. I mean, I was always really into music. I remember they did a trip to Disneyland when I was about five and they didn't really want to bother taking me. So they gave me the option of getting a record player or going to Disneyland. And I took the record player. So I said, no, I'll take a record player. And so, uh, cause I was always just really dug music and, uh, so I traded Disneyland for a record player when I was five. It, it's interesting. Uh, with the musicians that start off on piano, I normally get one of two experiences. Either mm -hmm. they love their first piano teacher or they couldn't stand her and quit after a year or him. Oh, yeah. No, mine was wonderful. And really, um, she always brought me a candy bar, one of those Rocky Roads before each lesson. Ah, and, that's uh, a secret. Yeah, she, she plied me with sugar. And um, she was wonderful. I studied with her probably three or four years. I mean, it was the old school. She came to the house. 
she came to the house and you uh, use the Shermer books i believe so yeah. Mm, yeah yeah i believe so you know got into some beethoven towards the end there and then uh you know started taking started playing tuba in uh seventh grade middle okay. so tuba was your first wind instrument yes definitely um uh, your, brother... lo- your band director loved you Oh yeah. Well, it was the kind of thing where they, you know, I didn't really know. I just took, I took beginning wins because it was either that or general music. And I had played piano for three years at that point. So I didn't want general music. And they just stuck us in a room and it was the day where they stick the tube out there and have people blow on it. And I, I stepped up and blow a pretty good F probably. And uh, they said, Oh, you want to play tuba? And my older brother played trombone. Uh, and he was in high school, was playing a high school band in, in uh, on trombone. So I went, yeah, sure, I'll. Uh, that, that that makes you very rare to yeah. start off on as a tuba player. Yeah, that is unusual. As I, yeah. as you well know. Yeah, it's. I have to tell you, it's very strange for me to be interviewing another uh, educator because a lot of the things that I talk about on my show are based around the fact that those kind of things. That yeah. So so the next obvious question. It's obvious to me, probably mm-hmm. not to you, is what did you think of the new Disney movie? I loved it. Soul, I loved it. I loved the message. Um, it was pretty funny because when I saw the scene with the trombone player, I knew it immediately was Andy Martin. I was like, that's Andy Martin. I, like in two notes. But I like the fact that uh, in that scene, I, I was reading that, I guess they shot a video of him and animated to uh, him playing what he played. So that that's why the facial... But that movie, you know, general picture, that movie I thought was awesome. Great message. Okay. I was surprised that they didn't lay heavier onto the teaching as his as his true calling. I, I thought that was going to end up being the message. Yeah, and that's funny because some some teachers did not take that away from that movie. I mean, I remember seeing some posts on some teacher threads and they were a little upset at the, the portraying teaching in that way. But I really took it away that he, he came to appreciate the uh, the impact he's making on others lives at the end teaching that's what i took away from it i was just curious to to get other people's takes on it because i sat and watched it with my family and you know the the opening scene well first of all that's i mean if we're going to talk about the movie uh when was the last time you heard a a junior high band play things ain't what they used to be (laughs) well i don't hear too many junior highs although um i think i played at the high school not too long ago, but what do junior high band play now? Well, that's the thing. Do they play jazz half the time? It's, you know, a rock tune written for jazz band. Well, you know? now do you teach jazz band there at that? I do. Lesson? I teach. Yeah. I teach jazz band, marching band, concert do, band. Do you actually teach jazz? Um, I no, sure try to, I'm getting less and less takers. <laughs> well, the question is what you were just alluded to kind of Yeah. is, is, a lot of educators take the easy way out and teach rock tunes that doesn't involve any feel, any jazz feel, any of that, uh, say, yeah. that triplet undertone. I haven't, you know, I haven't really run into that too much. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate teaching in Long Beach because we have pretty strong music programs at, at most. At really well, Long Beach Poly. In Long Beach Poly. Very well-known jazz uh, program. One of, he's my brother from another mother, Chris Stevens over there who I played golf with yesterday. Um, who won? He, uh, he, oh, he did. I, I'm in a rut right now. My swing sucks. I'm like, totally like going, what am I doing wrong? I, I am definitely, in a, everybody's beating me right now. So it's a very humbling thing. Um, but you know, he, when I went to Long Beach, it was basically, I, I decided when I decided to teach, I was teaching in another district. Um, and then when Wilson opened up, I knew what he was doing to Polly and I knew, wow, it'd be great to be the crosstown rival. And it has been great. I mean, I'll, I've never had a program the size of his program by any stretch, but I've had some good players go through there that have gone on to careers, um, in music. So, um, I'm, I'm thankful I ended up there and, uh, yeah, I teach improv. I teach jazz. Good for you. Jazz feel. Um, it's, you know, during this time, it's been interesting how to do that you know it's a lot of problem solving and trying stuff and go well, that didn't work and now, how old were you when you first uh heard or started wanting to learn jazz really um what started me wanting to play jazz was basically hmm 
It was later in high school. I, I started, I, you know, I started playing tuba in middle school and started playing bass in high school. No, what, what, what high school did you go to? James Monroe High School in what's North Hills, North Hills now was us uh, was uh, Sepulveda at the time, uh -huh. San Fernando Valley. Um, uh, what was Chuck? Uh, what was my high school band directors? I can't remember his last name. Chuck. Oh wow, I'm having a senior moment. It'll come to me. We all we all do. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think he was funny. He was a he, he you know he. He's a good musician, but I think he was a little bitter about teaching teaching school. <laughs> I don't think he I don't think he enjoyed his job a whole lot, but um, that's okay. We you know, but I got you know when I was in high school, I got recruited by Morel Fifely over at uh, Cal State Northridge. <laughs> so I played in the marching band at Northridge at 15 years old. Oh, okay. Um, so I was hanging out with guys like Tony Clements, uh, who's phenomenal sure. player and you know played up in the he plays in the bay area to this day and uh in fact i heard from him recently it was kind of funny um but i remember just being in this tuba section with tony and you know just him pulling the socks so i was really lucky to be exposed to that at like at 15 years old in high school so really i wasn't a full-fledged high school band member the last couple of years in high school i was playing at the college and doing that did you get in, introduced to improvisation then also Really, um, imp well, I was playing Dixieland gigs. Being a tuba player that played bass, I started playing some Dixieland gigs. Uh, and then I, when I went to Northridge, um, I started playing in the big bands under uh, Joel Leach's program, but like in the, in the lower bands playing bass. So I really got started to get serious about bass in college. And I was a tuba major playing bass. So I was really trying to do both well. And... Um, and so that was a really good place to be for me then. So I was playing in the big bands at Northridge. So really, I didn't ex get exposed to jazz really till in, until, um, well, I wish I was in a youth band, Royal Cavaliers, which Chris Stevens was also in. I, I understand that, yeah. And, they, we, you know, we did some shows. Because I, I was a drum corps jazz. guy. We used to watch the Royal oh, Cavaliers yeah. running around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he, you know, uh, Ron Combs would write some jazz-influenced shows. I mean, we did Channel One Suite one year, you know, and stuff like that. So I got some exposure in high school that way. and um, But really, college, and then starting to play uh, in the big bands at Northridge and Dixie and Gigs on tuba and kind of – that's when I started getting into jazz. Really, it was like a freshman in college, I would say. What, what approach do you use to teach improvisation? Well – Gosh, there's not one approach. I, I believe, you know, I do, first of all, some basic work as far as getting scales and relating them around the different keys. And then um, we do some, really actually what I'm doing this year, which I'm finding pretty good is uh, jazz etudes um, that I assign with a recording to play to. So they learn the language. Uh, and then we do some analysis as far as harmonically what that solo is doing with the chords uh with it. So we'll learn a solo and then I'll ask them to do like a harmonic analysis of each chord. Okay. By sort of a paper assignment. And, um, and then just really, um, in, in my instructional day when I'm live, I mean, I, especially in the fall, at least half the class is about improvisation and setting up, uh, chord changes in the rhythm section and have us play and, and then, you know, talking about certain, like maybe lead tones one day, or um, rhythmic elements another day. I, I find that you kind of have to break it down into small bits. You don't want to have them thinking about three or four things w at once. You know, one will be rhythmic on a simple chord. Another day, you know, a two, five, one progression, the lead tones. So you kind of mix it up that way. But right now in being virtual, I'm, I'm really going with jazz etudes more, which I like. And so I, I'm I, so I, happy. I'm so happy to hear that you don't uh, throw them both feet into the pentatonic pool. Um, and and give them a, a little bit wider basis. Well, it's funny because, I mean, I do touch on pentatonic, but I also talk about how much it's overused, especially for guitars. But see, the thing about a pentatonic on a saxophone is it doesn't lie necessarily that great. I mean, it's great on a guitar because it's simple. But um, but then there's, I, gosh, I wanted, found this one lesson just on pentatonics and ingenious ways of playing pentatonics. Uh, there's a great site called Jazz Advice dot com that's got great stuff 
one, th one thing being forced to teach online, I'm finding all these online resources that I just kind of knew about in the back of my head that I'm relying a lot more. And, uh, so it kind of makes me think that I'll change things a little bit when we're, when we're back in the classroom full time, a little bit. When, now that I'm not teaching all the time, mm -hmm. uh, it's made me, it's given me a chance to think that now as being a teacher, you can understand what I'm about to say, which is, I realized that I spent most of my career teaching shortcuts when it comes to jazz it playing sounds good. you got a show coming up so you got to come up with something you're, you're yeah, always teaching to a performance yeah and because of that you tend to try to find the most efficient way to get to a certain point the fastest yeah and and short a lot of information at least from all the educators i've talked to yeah. uh and i don't think That's i really true. really realized that myself until i had a chance to take a breath and look at what i was doing yeah, no, I'd have to agree with that. I mean, you, well, you know, you're, you're expected to put on a show in a month or whatever, and you want it to sound as good as possible. So you end to start thinking about, it's, it's almost like coaching a, a, an athletic team. You go with your strengths, you, you tailor programming to what you have. Um, and so that in an effect, it is shortcutting the, the full education. Um, yeah, th that's very true. You, you, you have, you have to it's it's career survival you know yeah it, 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 you, you can stick to your guns all the way to uh you know public embarrassment all the way to the unemployment careful. line yes yeah exactly well i got tenure baby they'd have to ah. i'd have to really do something dumb <laughs> although you know trust me I, you know i guess it's possible but yeah uh, no i've been there a long time yeah but you know what i'm you know what i'm saying uh um Actually, the, I, the realization came to me when I was toying with the idea of putting together uh, uh, how to play Dixieland tuba uh, uh, video. I was thinking, my son says, you know, you really ought to do this, Dad, him mm -hmm. being a director also. Yeah. Um, and and I, so I started thinking about the process and the steps, and I realized that I didn't want to do that. I didn't, it, it, would, it would basically be the same thing. You want to say, here's the fastest way to, to get here. And, and, uh, because then you start thinking about, well, you don't want to short the brass playing technique stuff. You don't want to start yeah. shorting breath control. You don't want to start shorting all these other things that are involved. Well, you really got to have your your basics together to sound good on Dixieland tuba. I mean, you got to be a good tuba player. Right. You know? um, and that's really actually why I, I kind of stopped playing for a while because I didn't feel like I had the time to keep my chops up. Well, I didn't. You know, um, so I didn't play for a while, tuba. I mean, I played bass. I, I, I'm sad to bass. hear that. <laughs> well, I just, I I couldn't find the time to keep my chops up. I can ask because I'll run, like I saw Brad Roth recently. So, so you're playing tuba? And I go, I said, at the time I said no. But one thing about the lockdown is I've been playing tuba again. It's like I've yeah. got. Uh, and I went the other direction when I. When I had a chance, I sold my string bass. So, you know. <laughs> ah, well, I, that's the thing. See, I, I had like five tubas and I pared it down to one. But that was about 15 years ago that I did that. Yeah, I, I, my kids were little. My son was in scouts. My daughter was playing soccer. And I was, you know, a very involved parent for my kids and, and a high school band director and gigging on bass, all, you know, a lot at mm -hmm. that time still. And so it was like I had, some had to give. I just didn't have the time to put on the tuba to sound the way I wanted to sound. Right. It's, yeah. it's interesting. The, one of the funny things about my channel my interview channel is uh, the amount of tuba players that I've interviewed. And, and, yeah. and it is kind of funny because uh, we spend a lot, you know, I would never, you're always one of my favorite players, but I would never tell you that. Of course not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? At, yeah, at, and, at the and, time. And, I, and I know, I know you're real good. Just find the, the company you keep and everybody you played with. I'm going, Oh man, this guy, you know, this is not only a good guy. Um, I don't know if I've, I don't know what recording you did back then, but I'd have to check it out. I, I am sure you did, but I just, you know. Actually, I have another channel that has a lot of my recordings on oh, it. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, which is just my full name, Daniel E. Zeilinger on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I've got a lot of album cuts and a few videos and things. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's... Now, you had Mark Curry on here, and it's funny because Mark sent me a CD, and, uh, and uh, if he sees this, I want to thank him because he sent me a CD of the Jazz Miners in 1980 that we did. And it was kind of funny. He's a great um, guy. He's a great guy. And, and uh, you know, we're on Facebook, but we don't, you know, we're kind of moving in different circles and stuff. But 
um, it was great that he sent this. It was kind of out of the blue. And, and uh, what, what happened is, you know, it, I know I'm skipping around a little bit. When I joined the Jazz Miners in 1980 um, at Disneyland, and that was huge for getting me experience, obviously. You know, that, was the, I, that was the same time when we stole Mark to do the yeah. Southern Comfort Band. Yeah. Right. That's, oh, that's right. The Southern Comfort Band. Yes, 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 yes. Well, that's, um, it's so funny because, well, actually a funny story um, about how that all happened because, you know, I, I was in college in Northridge in the late seventies. And so I started doing some Dixie and gigs uh, with the trauma player, Jeff Enlow. Okay. And he had the banjo player. He used Jimmy Turner. Right. You no, know Jimmy. Okay. So Jimmy though, Jimmy's the one that we were doing a gig and it was like 1979. He goes, you know, uh, the jazz miners are at Disneyland. Their tuba player is going to be leaving. And he, and he, he said, you know, they, they got a regular job at Disneyland playing Dixieland. You that was John, play. right? Yeah. John. Yeah. John was, um, you know, he took off in 1980 and, um, for his, you know, next chapter in his life. And so, but Jimmy's the one that told me about it. So I went down there with my girlfriend and, and met the band and met Rusty. And, and that's how I lined up an audition was basically, I knew there was an opening before it was posted. Basically. Oh, you're that guy. No, I, I auditioned. I auditioned. <laughs> no, I, I'm saying that, you know, Disneyland has a reputation putting out a cattle call for musicians and already having somebody else in mind. Well, I think they have to. Um, and I would say that back in that time, there wasn't a lot of guys playing tuba and bass and playing them pretty seriously at 19 years That's old. That's true. They're just, I kind of had that market sewn up at that point in time. I think I was very lucky because I've been playing bass about three years at that point in the bands at Northridge and, and kind of, you know, moving up the ranks there and as a tuba major. So I just, you know, it was the right place, right time, really, which is the story of pretty much everybody in the music business. Right. But what a great gift being at Disneyland at that time and with some amazing players. Well, you were there for what, 16 years? Well, I was there with the miners till 84 and then I played shows all through the eighties there. Um, you know, mo um, and I subbed the Disneyland band. Uh, I remember, you know, some of the Disneyland band when guys like Eric Marienthal were in the Disneyland band, you know, I've, I've um, actually tried to get Eric on the show. Yeah. And but, well, you know, his first gig, his first real pro gig was with Al Hurt. A lot of people uh -huh. don't, a lot of people don't know that. I'm, you probably do, but uh, I, I had t contacted him when I very first started this. Mm -hmm. He says, "No, I'm not a, you know, I, 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 I can't justify going on that show." And I went, "That's that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you, you know." Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah he, well, yeah. I mean, well, obviously, you know, he, um, gosh, I just watched him. Uh, with Chick's seventy uh, fifth birthday tour. Oh yeah, the guy's a superstar. Yeah, he's a superstar. I mean, that band was ridiculous. Yeah, I remember seeing Patatucci when he was in college at Long Beach State, and I was a bass player. We went to some jazz festival, and I'm watching the A band at Long Beach State, and it's Patatucci, and I I'd been playing bass, you know, string bass maybe like two years at that point. I'm hearing this guy going, "Oh man, I, I just want to go home." <laughs> <laughs> this guy's ridiculous. <laughs> And and he still is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah amazing. Yeah. You know, uh, I I quite often tell people that you, well, that we grew up in the eye of the hurricane. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in this area, uh, one of the reasons I didn't go on to become a, a professional lead trumpet player, which is where I started, was mm -hmm. just the amount of great lead trumpet players in the area. Oh yeah. You know, uh, and the musicianship in right around uh, Southern California is just at a ridiculous level uh, com yeah. compared to the rest of the country, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, well, you know, New York and LA, right? Yeah. You know, those are the, the hot spots. Or, well, Orlando's in there somewhere. In Orlando. True. True. Great. Like great players down there. I mean, there, you know, honestly, um, later I toured with Johnny Mathis as a bass player and got to hear musicians. I mean, there's great musicians in so many cities, not all of them, though. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's very true. Once in a while, we, you know, the way he structures his, the way they structure the band there is the rhythm section travels with Johnny, and then we pick up the orchestra wherever you're playing. And there are a few shows that, you know, the, the music director, Scott Lavender, would be like, okay, we better not do this one tonight. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> start changing the set, you know, the, the day of the show. Because, uh, yeah, to South Dakota, 
and all of a sudden yeah, yeah exactly the, just the picking's a little slim well you know and the doublers you know if the woodwinds on that book you're, you're crazy you know you'll clarinet sax oboe you know <laughs> uh no oboe solo tonight you know yeah, how long were you with johnny 10 years yeah 10 good years. gig huh yeah it was a great gig basically i i left basically to teach high school um because once I knew I was teaching high school, but I managed to actually stay on the gig touring and do a couple of years teaching at middle school level. So that was an interesting time, but I was there from 91 to 2001. Wow. Yeah, no, great, great, great experience was treated very well. And, uh, now who was, who, what was the rest of, who was in the rest of the rhythm section at that time? Well, uh, Gil Rigers, uh, was the tour manager guitarist. Um, I don't believe he plays guitar with them anymore, but he still manages, Scott Lavender was the music director, piano, still is. Joe Lazama has been with him since 1970, still his drummer. And then I was the bass player. And basically that was the core that traveled with them. It was just the rhythm section. Then we would pick up, but well, I got to play with some great players. Like in New York, we'd have an incredible band. I remember doing one um, A&E live by request show with the New York band and, uh, that was phenomenal because uh, that was a great experience, and and it lives on DVD. So I, a little, you know, memento of my time with Johnny. But I enjoyed it very much. Wonderful, yeah. Pretty pretty, pretty heady stuff. And you know, people you know people stay with them forever. I mean, they you know for for good reason. You know, it's a good gig. Yeah, but they didn't have the opportunity to teach high school, right? You know, or or middle school. I mean, who you know who could there you go, that up? Johnny Mathis, middle school. <laughs> Johnny Mathis. It really was just my kids were little. And, oh, I know. Um, yeah, that's why I came, that's why I came off the road. Yeah, I was, you know, I, my, I was doing I was doing forty airplane flights a year, and uh, you know, your kids started wondering who you are. They wonder who you are. You know, also the benefits of teaching, as far as you know, pensions and stuff like that, kind of started to speak to me more. You know, well, I'm, and I'm not telling you anything, but the reward of having a student come back 20 years later and say, you know, there's something you told me that, uh, you know, has oh, really yeah. served me well, Mr. M, you know? Yeah. In fact, you know, one of my ex students, he, in fact, he got to experience my first, my first travails as a high school band director is Matt Gullett, who is very successful middle school teacher in the Cypress area. And if Matt sees this, I still have this. He gave me when he graduated in 2003, I think it was. Because, you know, I I kind of lose my mind once in a while. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, don't we all? Yeah. That was easy. Still works. <laughs> and uh, and so, yeah, he gave that to me as a parting gift when he graduated. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm glad I got the years down under my belt now. You know, I kind of know what to worry about and what to let go. Yeah, I actually have several shelves in my office that are filled with nothing but memorabilia from uh, band students and parents. And yeah. uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a reward that I would never give up for anything else. That, that feeling of uh, helping somebody else love music. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, I, I hear from, I heard it from a student, Jacob, who's he's um, recording with an artist in Nashville. He decided he moved to Nashville after high school. I don't even think he, I, I don't know this. He, he's, he's just been out a few years, but he uh, did a, did a podcast or a, did a, a webcast with a, an artist uh, that's got a new record and he's in the band singing and playing bass. I'm like, Hey, Jacob, stuff like that happens all the time. And you just go, that's pretty cool. So wh what are you doing to get your chops back in shape? Well, long tones and, and really my, my biggest challenge is funny. Um, I think it's just the way my face is built. I have a hard time. Um, if I'm not playing all the time, I have a hard time with my low range. Um, and that was always a battle for me. It's funny. I loved playing high and playing solos, but you gotta have a low range, especially, you know, playing if you're doing any symphony stuff or recording dates. Um, not that I'm looking to, I'm just playing for myself right now. Oh, I understand. But you, the low range, so really just long tones, and then I have some Blazevich sitting here, and uh, and then I'll, I'll play a jazz etude too, you know. Um, but I'm just kind of trying to play a little bit every day, and it's slowly coming back. 
as I while. as I've gotten older, my my basic warm up has changed. I now for me, uh, as soon as I can get my pedal B flat happening, I know I'm ready. I don't even have a pedal B flat right now. I cannot do it. I mean, I I've sat and then I can't out of air because I'm like, <sighs> so I don't know. I'm having a hard time setting the embouchure low enough. And I think it's partly partly due to the fact that I played trombone for years teaching jazz. I had a little valve trombone. And so I wasn't playing tuba and I was playing trombone and my embouchure is just way too tight. I just got to, you know, also have this, um, Alan Bear, Chicago Symphony, taught me that. Ah, uh, yes. I used to take this on the road. Because, you know, uh, back in the, when I was touring with Johnny, I was still playing some some more high-profile tuba gigs. So I had to have my chops in shape, so I would take this on the road. And do There's no tuba in Johnny's show, huh? No tuba in Johnny's show, no. Did he know that you played tuba? Uh, he may not know I play tuba at all. Yeah, because they, not... they may have written a couple of tunes if they would have known. Nah. <laughs> They'd have to pay shipping. Forget it. Chance is It's a business. It's, a business. <laughs> it's definitely not about. It's the Johnny Mathis show. It's definitely not about the bass player. I don't know. Nature Boy with tuba might work. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. Let's hear it. <laughs> I sorry. I digress. Quite often, actually. <laughs> yeah. So no. I, it's very well. It's funny because I did a Japanese tour on bass and they actually let me take my little tuba that was, they were nice enough to, I had, I had a tuba over there cause I was there for six months in what, what year was that? 90, 91 with Jerome Robbins Broadway. Um, subbed in the show when it was here in LA and then did the Japanese tour. That was a fun tour. I have some good videos on that one, but, uh, so they let me take a tuba. So I managed to keep my tuba chops kind of together. It's interesting how uh, how popular classic jazz is in Japan. Is it pretty pretty much? Yeah, um, uh, I know that I, I toured over there when I was when I was playing with Banjo Mania and those guys. Yeah, uh, originally, and uh, we were we were doing live television uh, variety shows. Uh, yeah, I saw some of those pictures with Brad and Doug. Yeah, which, which I thought was crazy. That and, is crazy. Uh, uh, and, and well, you've done enough international travel that, you know, you can turn on the radio almost anywhere in the world and hear uh, American rock. Oh, yeah. But how often can you turn on a, a radio station here and hear Slovakian folk tunes? You know, it's <laughs> uh, it's really not a bad question. Uh, no, it's, it's a very fair question. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, American rock's basically, and jazz, you know, jazz definitely embraced in other countries, um, more than it is here for the most part. I mean, I, I know jazz musicians that have moved to France. You know, oh, Gary Kaiser. Yeah, and, and Jared Hangen and, and Leslie Lewis, you know, yeah. over there. So that, you know. In, in yeah. fact, my, my first interview today was a guy named Elazar, uh, who, who's actually has a Dixieland band in Jerusalem. Oh, really? And we were talking about that. Uh, uh, interesting fellow. He's actually originally from Pittsburgh, and and went to high school at Saddleback in Santa Ana. Oh no way! <laughs> but now runs the only Dixieland band in in his general area in. Uh, wow! Well, what kind of gigs does he do out there? Do they have a concert? Uh, same thing. Same kind of things we do. He does conventions and parties and yeah, uh, you know, supermarket openings and. By the way, if you run across a good fiberglass sousaphone that's for sale, let me know. Right, a good one though, one that plays well. Well, I would I would say stick to the cons. Um, yeah, but uh, I know I'm right. Yeah, Eric, there's I, some I can't. dogs out there. <laughs> I'm older than you are, sir. And, and, are you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was well, born in '54. Oh, you are older than me. Wow, you're but, a lot old. Not kidding. I'm no, actually by quite a bit. But uh, and up until actually, I still play. My uh, my big uh, naked lady con, uh, silver con, you know. Do you really? Not standing. Uh, not anymore. Uh, yeah. As about as about a year ago, I was standing still. Well, you know, I have one tuba, so I'll play this, uh, and I can stand. I got a you know like a snare strap that holds it. Tommy Johnson showed me that trick, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. When I was studying with I was studying with Tommy when I got the gig at Disney, and he showed me how to 
configure a strap for my tuba. I go, oh, thank you, Tommy. And amongst the many other things he taught me. But, um, but uh, yeah, so I just play that now. But, I, you know, a, a fiberglass sousaphone would be nice. My son was one of those kids who got to play in the 2000 Olympics. Oh, wow. And I sold my mirror phone to pay for that trip. Uh, both my son and daughter were in that band. And uh, so nice. I, I miss my mirror phone. Yeah, that no, I well, it's kind of funny because actually I sold my original 185 that I had in the 80s, and then I had an 80, an 88, and I had all these other tubas. And then when I decided to downsize, uh, Fred Green uh, helped me out, like finding you know, finding people who want to buy my tubas. And and then he sold me this 85. And the one thing he said is, You can't sell this tuba, he's talked to me first. And then, Fred, if you're out there, I, I still have it. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's around. I eighty five. You know, another thing you do uh, that I used to do uh, sometimes back then is um, you can attach a duck call to the fifth valve. And uh, I did a thing for a while where I play one and three tuba notes and then a duck call on two and four. I cut that. But now I think I'd pass out if I tried to do that now. I don't think you learned that from Tommy John. No, Tommy Johnson did not teach me that. That was something <laughs> I figured out on my own. But those that remember me doing that. I have the same tube and I still have, I found the duck call in the bag. I still have it. That's funny. So it, who knows? Maybe I'll start working on that. That'd be hilarious. You know what? I never played double C. Oh, no. See, I was doing symphony auditions and I had F tuba. In fact, I really got into soloing on F tuba uh, as the years went on and kind of, I wish I'd recorded myself more, but I, you know, I started playing more F tuba than anything really it was, I had a, you know, a, a big bore F. Um, but no, I was, you know, tuba was my major and, and I was, you know, I was fortunate enough. I did some, you know, regular session oh, yeah. sessions back in the day. Um, one, I remember, I'll, I'll never forget one back in like early nineties, I showed up and I'm looking, you know, this was a date, uh, uh, Dan Savant, I think was the contractor. Anyway, um, John Demney was a composer. Anyway, I go in and like, what? where's the tuba chair? And then there was a chair in the middle of the room and that's where the tuba is. And it, it was a Flintstones cartoon. <laughs> so if Tommy Johnson played all the original ones and you know, maybe they didn't want to pay, he, he was working for triple scale back then and they decided to get the single scale guy in there. And uh, yeah, I had all these tuba solos on that thing. That was, uh, and this, I was already touring with Johnny. So it was like, but it went well. It went well, and so I found that that's up on YouTube somewhere. Oh and, yeah, there, there's nothing like me walking into a studio job or a or a, a legit gig with my B flat and getting dirty looks. You know, that's yeah, yeah. No, I mean it was my thing. I was it, oh well. It was you know, bass was the one that I was you know mostly self taught. Although I did later take some lessons um, with Gary Pratt over at Long Beach at he's not Long Beach at Cal State Northridge and. Uh, some some other you know classical lessons along the way but tuba was the one i studied for years with jim self tommy johnson took from roger bobo for a while he was a very intense cat so i hear i, I don't know yeah. the man i didn't know the man very very intense he scared me <laughs> but did you learn anything oh yeah i learned a lot i learned a lot now i wish i could recreate what i learned now but i learned a lot which Maybe it was part of the problem when I became, when I couldn't play as much, it's like I, I knew what I should be able to do and I couldn't do it. And I was like, <sighs> but uh, I kind of had to let that go. But yeah, he was, he was phenomenal. I mean, I mean, I remember one thing he said, he says, you know, there's a hundred different ways you can play a note. So which way are you going to play this? Dan, which way are you going to play this note? There's we'll see. <laughs> If it's anything like my golf game, it could go a ten of different places. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of how the note works right now. I don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what comes out. <laughs> my dad was a golfer. I never picked it up myself, but but, but he uh, enjoyed it. I am, yeah. I'm struggling right now. It's funny because I got new clubs, um, and I was doing really good and took some lessons, and then I took a little time off and came back, and so now I don't know what's up. It's all it's all here though, you know. It's I guess, but that, they say that about everything. Yeah, that's true. So really, somewhere in me, I do have a pedal B flat. I just haven't figured out how to trick my lips into doing it right now. 
So once Maybe, you get the pedal, you you know you're good. Right. Yeah. I can I can play pretty much. Well, I'm not doing anything really demanding. I'm I'm doing strictly only Dixieland for the past 15, 20 years now. Yeah. I and mean, really, to be honest with you, that's what I look to do. I just I did one recently and I had so much fun. I go, you know. But I know if I can play the pedal, I can play anything in the range of the horn that I need to play. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the double B flat, you know. Yeah. Although for soloing, it's not bad. But. And a few things that I don't need to play if you ask the people I play with. But uh, <laughs> but have you put the duck call on the fifth valve yet? No, that I haven't done. I don't I don't carry a kazoo. Yeah. Um, uh, and, I, and I don't shoot fireworks out of my bell. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of uh, fireworks, actually, just showing you how good I am at uh, zooming, um, I found this video. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe I shouldn't show it. It was funny. It's a guy um, playing Darth Vader theme on bagpipes, shoveling snow on a unicycle and with <laughs> flaming bagpipes. No, I, 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 I did interview David Silverman. You know David? No, who's that? He, he's a producer on The Simpsons, uh -huh. but he also plays sousaphone. And he... Uh, and oh, he, you know, I met him. I met him. Yeah, he he does Burning Man every year or when it was yeah. going on, and and he likes to light up his horn. And earlier this morning, like I said, I, I interviewed Dave Gamont. Oh, did you? I did. And, uh, You're and smiling. He, I totally ripped off his version of that when I was at the Miners. Yeah. yeah. And and so it was a really nice interview, but, you know, he had uh, one of his pyrotechnics go wrong. And... and, uh, and <laughs> Really he messed things up. Oh, what, what Rosie O'Grady's? Is that what yeah? He, yeah. What what happened? I'm not. I didn't. I didn't get into the details of what, it, but it ended up put a, a black mushroom cloud. It was such a powerful explosion that uh, it blew the horn off of his face and most of the hair. Oh God! <laughs> so he's on your. I have to look that up. I'd like to see that interview. Well, I just interviewed him today. Okay, so when does so, that come up? Well, oh, golly. A day then for you, huh? Probably next month. Oh, today oh, he has a big influence because basically the miners, when I first got in, oh, yeah, Rosie O'Grady's band and playing me all this stuff. And, you know, John Allred ended up joining us later. But Yeah, I've, I've uh, actually, I interviewed both Bill and John Great. Allred. Okay, and, I can see that one. But I haven't, but the one, the, the day I recorded John, uh, the typical Zeilinger move, I forgot to press record and the, the interview didn't get recorded. Oh, no. And it was with him and his dad together. Oh, no. But uh, B since then, Bill has come back and interviewed one solo. I mm -hmm. still haven't gotten John lined up for a solo one. Yeah. But uh, Well, it's funny because, you know, when you initially reached out to me, I got to apologize for not getting back to you for so long. I, I kind of forgot about your message. But this is right before we were getting ready to teach again online. And not to get in, but the district time, they decided to t to uh, have us take over a new learning system called Canvas. Uh huh. And so I was knee deep in trying to learn this, you know, figure out how I'm teach marching band online and canvas all at the same time. I understand. Uh, uh, well, like you said, my son's a producer of the show. Actually, the show was his idea. Yeah. And and uh, and so he's not only is he the band director at Orange Lutheran, he's also the director now of the Impulse Drum and Bugle Corps. Oh, is he? And plus, he's producing the show for me. So he's got his hands full. And and uh, if there's anybody who understands, why yeah, the drum and bugle corps scene is getting hit so hard by this. I uh, God bless him. I hope you know. Yeah, he's he's, he's now the currently the director of Impulse, which mm -hmm. was a group that I started actually. I helped oh, start. I didn't know that you started Impulse. Yep. Yeah. I, I will. I when I was a kid, I marched with the VK. Oh, yeah. Uh, as as a trumpet player, actually. Okay. Yeah. As a soprano player. So yeah, I'm 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 one of those guys. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I, I, and I apologize. Oh. No, the Cavaliers used to do shows. We, I, you know, I got acquainted to the whole uh, DCI crowd back then. And my brother was a huge fan. He's, he's, he's about, he's about your age, my brother. And, um, you know, was way into DCI and, and, you know, it just happened with me. I was in the Cavaliers. And when I was 17, I, I, I was kind of young. I started college at 17. Yeah. And then I was just starting to study and, you know, so I kind of broke away from that stuff and uh, well there are a few years there where the youth yeah. band and the and the local drum corps would have combined shows that's what that was the era i was in yeah like, with the royal cavaliers and who, was the, who were the other bands um santa there, wins santa Ana wins right but uh, they would do they were full on field Whittier shows Cavaliers. that would I happen Whittier did field Whittier, Whittier, Elks, Whittier Elks, yeah 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember seeing Kingsman back then, and yeah, when, buddy, Chris, when know, the Kingsman were national champions, I was slugging it out with the Velvet Knights. So what can I say? Yeah, but the Velvet Knights always had that kind of a tongue-in-cheek <laughs> thing about them that was kind of cool. You realize that Gary Wampler was I one of those Kingsmen, that. right? Yeah, I yes, I do because he did that. Didn't he do that? They did a show like in two thousand seven or something. Right, the alumni. But this was while I was retired from tuba, and and yeah, my buddy's like, "Oh, you got to do this." I go, "No, nah, I'm not doing that." A bunch of a bunch of guys who do it admit that came out of the Kingsmen. Uh, uh, you remember Ed Slauson? Sure. That he was actually the guy who played the timpani solo on Ritual Fire Dance in '72, and uh, Mike Alarcon was a was a tenor oh, player wow. I didn't uh, at that time. Wow. Well, so, it really is kind of a small world when you think about it, uh, the music world and brass and. Da, 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 da. Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't. <laughs> Careful, I might sing too. You said it. Oh, here we go. It's a smell. I'll stop now. Well, uh, uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it, and it's great. You know, the re one of the things I got out of this is this show has had so many unexpected consequences. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to find something to, to do and get myself out of my wife's hair, basically. And, my, and, and it was my son's idea because I had done a Zoom call for Impulse. For him, since I was the uh, one of the original rangers of that corps, and uh, and he says, you know, Dad, you ought to get together with all the people you've met in your career, and do interviews, do do Zoom calls. So this was his idea. That's a great idea. And tell him I say hello. I, I will certainly do that. He, we were I, talking I, about like it. Like right I said, there. I saw him at a field show competition, and hopefully, I'll see him again. You know, yeah. back when we're doing show. Hopefully, or this fall, we'll see. You know? Yep, 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 yep. So, uh, so thank you for your time. Thanks, Dan. And, uh, and make sure to, to scroll through my interviews and, and catch up with some of your old friends. I will. But before we go, did Mark play you any of that stuff from 1980, Jazz Miners? No. Uh, uh, was that the whole The Tiger album? No, it wasn't an album at all. See, that's the thing. It was something I didn't get to tell the story. Real quick, we got hired to come in and just lay down, down real fast this music we played in the park. And it was for an amusement. It was for Atlantic City. And what, what was funny about it is in the 90s when I was touring with Mathis, I go into one of the casinos in the bathroom and I hear this. <laughs> was that that big Disney disc? This was not a record. Okay. This was just literally what it was, was we literally went in the studio and recorded like an hour's worth of tunes that was for background music at an Atlantic City casino. And I forget the guy who asked us to do it. And we just recorded, you know, public domain stuff that we did in the park. But it's like oh. the snapshot of what we were in 1980. You've got to put that online, Eric. I should. I, I don't think I'd get in trouble. No. And, and it's okay. Andy Martin, the year he was in the band. And, and believe me, talk about schooling. I mean, the dude at 20 years old, you hear him playing, is just so mature and, and the ideas he's... And honestly, every time I solo, I'm going, well, it's not Andy Martin, but I'll give it my best. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he, yeah. So it was, and I really, when I got on that band and heard Andy play, because we got on the band at the same time, I was just like, well, you can recognize Brad from a mile away. Right. right exactly. You know, and, um, but what a, what a fun thing that I'm so glad that Mark did that. Really? Yes, that's nice to know the people around the world are pissing to it. No, I'm just kidding. Well, that's it. I was literally at a urinal hearing myself. And I quite, what the heck? That's the jazz miners. And I totally forgot that we did it, you know, because it was 1980 and this was like 1995. And, uh, but yeah, Mark sent me that CD, I think last year. Uh, he's, he's a great guy. You know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, if you saw the interview, you realized that he had actually stopped playing for a while. And, uh, and that, that really upset me when I heard that. And he, yeah. he's is back he at it. So again, I'll need to watch it, but he's, he's playing again, right? Yes. Good. I, I will watch it. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, I, I, I actually, uh, I just based this show completely on conversations. Mm -hmm. Although uh, um, I had, uh, I've had a couple of people try and sneak some pictures in and a couple of people try and stick some recordings in, but I don't want to have to deal with the possibility of right. copyright infringements. Right. 
and what I really miss and what I'm enjoying about the show is kind of that musician lounge hanging where we'd right. all just get together and, and talk and gossip and catch up with each other. Oh uh, yeah. Aside from the music, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, I think we're all missing that right now. I mean, um, there's some great posts about what we miss, you know, just this time, not being able to gig and really that, that camaraderie you get. Exactly. And, and, and uh, you know, musicians have a very peculiar way of looking at life that, <laughs> to be honest with you, I mean, non-musicians don't get. Yeah. I think you have to be a musician to kind of understand a musician. Uh, it's funny you say that. Uh, I, I used to have real problems at my in-laws because they just didn't get it. They didn't, un, they didn't know how to relate yeah. to me. Yeah. No, I... Oh, I could go on. That'll be another whole show. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it will be, Eric. We'll see. Okay. Listen... Thank you for your time once again. Uh, take care, and if there's uh, if there's anything uh, I I can ever do uh, that you that you could use, but since you're a self-contained musician, do your own arranging and things. I'm kind of spitting in the wind here, but let me know if I can ever be of service. I will, Dan. Um, I'll uh, hope our paths cross real soon, doing something. Well, if nothing else, I'm sure that you'll uh, be rubbing elbows with my son soon. I hope so. All right, you guys take care now. Thanks, Dan. You too. You Bye -bye. too. Thank you for watching Trad Jazz Today. Dan posts new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to check out the archive of past shows, and please give us a thumbs up when you subscribe to the channel. Bye.